Yahweh promises to gather everyone he scattered. I am a Hebrew. We are Hebrews. I am a Hebrew, I was born in Texas. I am a Hebrew, and I am from Florida. I'm a Hebrew, and I was born in California. I am a Hebrew, and I was born in San Diego, California. I'm a Hebrew, I was born in Indiana. I am a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I am a Hebrew, and I was born in Spain. I was born in Hebrew, I was born in Hebrew, and I was born in Spain. I was born in Hebrew, I was born in Spain. I am a Hebrew, from West Africa, Liberia. I am a Hebrew, and I was born in Straight Lane. We are Hebrews. I will make Shalom and greetings, hallelujah, to the women of the covenant. Bless each of you that are determined to run this race with patience, hallelujah. I pray that peace is upon you. I pray that obedience is in your members, hallelujah. Thank you to every woman who listens and is willing to accept every truth and to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I am your host tonight. I'm Ashley. I am a wife, a friend, a sister, and a community living saint, hallelujah. I'm a mother. And I'm thankful for this show and for the opportunity to show my gratefulness to my creator. Thank you, Father, for everyone around me and for this land. Thank you for the sound checks that are coming in. I pray that you can hear me very, very clearly. Thank you for the tents. And bless you to everyone scattered very, very far away and everyone that I'm unable to see um, often. Hallelujah. The saints on the land love you and miss you dearly. Mother Jennifer's with me in Georgia. Can we get a sound check, please? Say a few words. Shalom and blessings to you, Sister Ashley, um, and blessings to you all, Daughters of Zion. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Sister Ashley, thank you for allowing me to be on the broadcast tonight. I pray that everyone can hear me. 
um, clearly, and it looks like we've got tens coming into the chat room, and we're ready to roll. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. Tonight we want to talk about how to regain respect and value for yourself after the mental scars of rape and promiscuity. So I'll put the idea out for the flow of the show first so that you may grab a pen, pencil, uh, the Bible if you desire, or if you just intend on listening or maybe even going back. It's things that we'll say tonight that we've never said before, and it's time, hallelujah, to discuss it in this format. I thank the Father for this uh, ability to reach each of you through our own testimonies. We have an email. I have a couple books in front of me. It's a lot of information to try to pack into a show. I pray that it flows. I pray that it's easily received and that you're able to uh, really, really gain from it. So I'd first like to acknowledge uh, my creator um, for the mind of Christ that he allowed me to attain and reach and achieve and strive for. I'm very thankful for the renewing of my mind and for who I am today. I don't recall who I used to be at all, and I pray that each of you will also gain that same testimony. Um, I'm very, very thankful to my master and husband covering uh, Deacon Bell, who is literally emptied himself of all selfish desires. He only wants Yah's will to be done in his home, in his heart, and in his life, and it's it's true. He's literally surrendered his life to the Father uh, since I met him and years before me. Um, he's not a lustful man. He's pure at heart. He has a very gentle presence that encourages those who love him and want to be around him, those who admire him, and I honor him tonight. Bless you if you were able to listen or even hear this greeting, and I submit my life to you and your desires. To the strongest man that many of you know, um, our shepherd, um, you know, when I hear someone say that he's strong or they honor him, whether it's with their heart or with their lips, um, I think a little bit differently. And I don't consider his title as the strongest man that many men know as a physical title. You know, we know that strength is often useful, and we know that he is strong according to the flesh. But in my mind, my shepherd is strong because of his surrender to Yah, his mental commitment to pass, you know, all flesh and all earth and everyone around him, uh, family, friends, foes, enemies, and, and literally surrender himself to accomplish something that is seen as trivial or senile. And what I mean is to accomplish this goal, this community, to continue to run this race, uh, running for something that has not yet been reached, uh, though it's being fulfilled and though the vision is fruitful, he's yet to arrive to the kingdom, you know, to receive a crown. And just as Noah hammered boards of wood, could you imagine, for years to build what appeared to be unnecessary, and for those 140 years of building, in the end, it proved that beasts were more worthy of saving than the souls of men. And I literally admire the strength that Pastor has because he knows the mind he's up against. He knows the ratio of those that will hear. And he knows that a lot of what he says, though he's obedient in his speech, it's in vain to a lot of your ears. And I admire him for the strength to continue to press on and to, I have watched him uh, grow in a great magnitude. I bless his house, each of his wives, his women, his family, even all of his children, no matter where they are. So here we are, Mother Jennifer, giving all honor to the Most High Yah and so many um, names and thank yous, you know, from last week and from the feast. And I dare not take a lot of our time that's precious tonight. Um, but I do want to thank, again, um, Clarksville and Esther and Rachel there of New York, Clarksville. Um, every community from South Carolina to Georgia to Goshen to Texas, to those on the snack team, thank you all. Uh, Sonia Crago, bless you. I saw you at the playground more than you were anywhere else, and you were a nanny, you know, a grandma, the, the feast, and I thank you for that. And whether I saw each of you or not, I thank you for your commitment and everything that y'all brought, everything you gave, and the spirit that you brought to the land. Bless uh, Brother Timu, all of his house. Thank you to Sakina for the class that she gave to any of you or some of you who came. 
to the dessert team, Sister Lisa, and to my beloved sister Adele. I love you. And can't leave out there in Georgia, Mother Jennifer, Jaden, Malik, and then my my son, my spiritual son, Carlisle, as well. Um, bless you to Lions Den on Facebook and to our teacher, Eric Robinson. Hallelujah. Um, please share your, your heart, Mother Jennifer. Hallelujah. Um, first and foremost, I want to just give honor and glory to the Most High Yah for um, his keeping us, his loving commitment towards us, um, the fact that he will never break covenant with us. Um, you know, I'm so grateful that he knows our thoughts, that he tests us and he tries us by um, understanding and discerning who we are by the things that we speak, not necessarily the things that come out of our mouths. Um, I'm so grateful for his love and his kindness towards us and the fact that <clears throat> he purges us. Sister Ashley, you had the testimony that you don't remember who you were, um, you know, the old you. And I'm grateful to have that testimony as well um, because of the Most High Yah and because of my head, uh, my master, Elder Rufus, teaching me what it really meant to purge and how to purge. So I just want to acknowledge him for um, the freedom that I have today, the freedom that I'm able to live today um, from being the woman that I used to be, being able to put aside the old woman because of his love for the Father, his love for the Most High, his example, and him understanding and knowing what it means to truly purge um, the dead works and to not operate in those dead works anymore. So I'm grateful uh, to Elder Rufus for providing for his family um, in so many ways and for ruling his house very well. And I want to acknowledge um, our shepherd, Pastor Dow, for continually loving us, giving us the, the very stern but needed talks that we all need and always giving us uh, no matter who it's directed towards, it's always directed towards us. It's always directed towards me. Um, I'm never pointing the finger at somebody else when we are receiving love, uh, when we're being chastened. I'm always thinking of myself. And so I'm so grateful to Pastor Dow for truly loving Yah's sheep and for being a Jeremiah 315 pastor. So blessing to you, Pastor Dial, and to your entire family. And I want to um, give one more acknowledgement to Straightway Texas for the hospitality that we received, um, Elder Rufus's family last week when we went there, the bond and the love of the sisters, uh, the meekness of Sister Carell, and, you know, the leading of Brother Greg and, just for, for hosting Elder Rufus's family and for sending our dear sister Bonnie off with so much love. Blessings to you, Straightway Texas. We love you so much. And that's all I have, Sister Ashley. Hallelujah. Blessings, Sister Bonnie. Elder Rufus, bless you all. So uh, just a quick note from our sister Charmaine, who volunteered and was willing years ago to begin her idea of what she calls Judah's Closet, and it really pays off. I think she had a successful year. I'll read this letter to you. Judah's Closet is her accepting clothes from each of us so that she may get them to someone else, kind of like our own thrift or our own, um, you know, help yourself kind of kind of set up every feast of tabernacle. So she says, Sister Ashley, please thank all the straightway sisters that participated in Judah's Closet this year. Mainly all the clothes were in great condition. They were clean and smelled great. I got a lot of wonderful feedback about the quality of clothes that were given. Israel came through again. Thank you all, my sisters, Sister Charmaine. So thank you, Sister Charmaine, for taking the time to uh, get that acknowledgement out there. I pray that uh, those of you who are kicking off your homeschool year, I pray that you're kicking it off with energy, with joy, um, you know, as a mother, and it being the highest calling that you can walk in. It's really uh, the most selfless expression of a woman that you can be. Uh, to be a servant, yes, and to even serve your master's children. So um, 
I hope that you're able to reach out and connect with those who are in homeschool. If you need help with homeschool, we do have an inner network of women who uh, are committed to teaching their own children, and it works successfully. Um, there's quite a few of us that will relate, bounce things off of each other, and really want the best for the students. So I pray as you, if you are a homeschool mom considering it or uh, just starting off, I pray that you be just as encouraged as if you've done it for 10 years. Don't be intimidated and bless you and your master's seed as y'all learn together this year. Uh, any announcements, Mother Jennifer? Um, Sister Ashley, I currently have no announcements. All right, no announcements. Let's kick it off. Um, I really, I, I guess I'll go to a clip first. I don't really have any rhyme or reason to the things that I've gathered. I know that they'll all flow together. Um, this is some things that, you know, I haven't even bounced off of Mother Jennifer yet. I like to reserve things from her anyway so that she will be um, just really whatever comes to mind first, you know, be really directed, no premeditation, just really off the fly. And uh, so that's how we're going to go tonight. Like I said, we want, um, we're going to bring up Straightway Shabbat service last week, 10-17-2020. Um, and I personally, this has nothing to do with anyone else on earth, I personally am so thankful for the strength of this type of message because the Father is, has and is always trying to get us to fear him. But I appreciate the standard being set high, and I appreciate our leaders who will not deviate the standard to anyone's selfish desires. And so this type of message really expresses the strength of the word and the refusal to back down. Um, so if you didn't catch the message, check it out on Straightway Live, Straightway Shabbat Service 10, 17, 20, 20. Um, Mother Jennifer, can we go to our first clip if you don't mind me playing it? Are you ready? And I'll just, uh, we'll go back and forth for a little bit and build the show. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yes. I'm ready to start. All right. As always, my brother Steve and, and brother Ugly uh, there in, in Canada and anyone else, give me some sound checks. Make sure you can, you know, communicate with Sister Sakina, who's faithful. She's here every week. Um, if I say, hey, grab verse so-and-so or word search so-and-so, uh, when I'm off air, she'll find it for me and, you know, pass it right to me. Uh, she's just faithful to also log in all the phone numbers onto my screen from her computer so that I can see who you are when you call. And if you've never called, then you would be a new number, of course. But uh, tonight we'll hold off on the phone calls just to get uh, some rhythm going. And as I said, please take some notes. We're going about 41 minutes in to this past Shabbat's message, all right? And we're going to kind of bring up um, a term, anarchy. We'll talk about it in a second. And we're also going to, um, I guess, kind of build the idea, Mother Jennifer, that um, we are a people that is instructed. We, as in, we say straightway, but those under the headship of Christ, the Messiah, those under the covenant of our creator, Yahweh, um, whether married in the flesh or not, we want to be instructed. And I know a lot, I can't say a lot, I know women that want to be instructed. I know women who are committed to the father and their master and their husband. I know women who are striving for holiness and covering their body and shutting their mouths and stopping their tongues and surrendering their lives. I know women who are striving to be impeccable in character. And it is, how would I, what word would I say? It is sad. It's a stab towards these women to try to penetrate your will if you're outside of our pattern of thinking, if you're not under the covering, if you're not submitted to the same law and authority that we submit ourselves to, but yet you judge or act outside of that, we cannot agree with your mind. We actually can't think the same. Right? So, so tonight I'm speaking to those who are striving to be clean and become more clean. I'm not speaking to those who are going to do their own will. I believe one of the most frequent, brought-up things that we speak of on the show is women who are just thirsty for men and not the Messiah. Mother Jennifer? 
Sister Ashley, it, it, it's very true, and we even um, mentioned it during the Mother's Talk that we had with Mother Carol during the feast. Um, you know, there are women who come into the ministry, and some are, are truly hungry for uh, a true, valuable relationship with the Most High God. And those are the ones who are truly chasing after that that relationship, after that um, high level of holiness. And those are the ones who know the Father's heart, and they know his desires, and they just want his desires. And those are the ones who are truly getting blessed because they're not thinking about anything else except for the will of Yah. And then there are those who come in, and they're thinking about um, just having a man, you know, not understanding that you are covered in this ministry if you submit and if you obey, you do have spiritual headship. You do have a covering. So we get that question a lot. You know, um, we get a lot of single women asking about being covered, and you are covered if you are going to obey the rule and the authority and to submit. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. We don't speak directly to anyone nor have any name in mind to the personal situations that our leaders have to handle, we dare not address or even bring up. We as women can't even add to or even take away what their words or their judgments have set out to do. So we're merely uh, discussing a spiritual presence that is trying to snuff out holiness to present itself as a sexual, sensual, devilish atmosphere. And it can affect you in your weakness. It can affect you in your rejection. Right? So um, I think that's enough said. But but just remember that we're going to kick off this soundbite speaking to people who don't want to be instructed. That's that's what he's dealing with here. Okay, so I hope this, hope this fits and we'll be right back. All right? 41 minutes in to last Shabbat's message. Here we go. See, so today we live in a generation that does not want to be instructed. So they assume that when we're making these laws, we're not really truly making these laws. What we're doing is trying to bring this law up. Okay, Paul, what kind of law are we talking about? Well, that a man or a woman should go through proper protocols. That's what he's talking about. Back to the word. Can I give you an example? Huh? You know, the book teaches that there should not be a whore amongst the daughters of Israel, nor a whoremonger. Is that right? Now watch this. That could have been you in your previous life prior to conversion. Is that right? That could have been you in your previous life prior to conversion. How do you become virgins? You become virgins at the renewed, being born again, man and woman of Yah. The problem is, it's trying to keep people virgins. See, to be a virgin, that means you are under authority. You're not a woman in anarchy. You're under a headship. You're under command. Man, woman, man, woman. See, we ourselves, I probably this is a little later on too, we can be in no more walking after our own mind. And our own dictates and mandates as a woman can in this world. Because a man without Yah is in total anarchy. A man without Messiah, without the headship of Messiah, is in total anarchy. And a woman without proper headship and in walking in under authority is in total anarchy against Yah. All right, so what does he mean? Anarchy is a state of... Disorder. I'm on Google. A state of disorder due to absence or non-recognition of authority. All right? So a disorder due to the absence of authority. All right? 
Okay, so how do you, each of you, gain authority, no matter where you are? How do you get it? Who's in front of you? Who? Where do? I, where can I find it? Women say. How do I submit? Who do I call? Who do I talk to? Well, you keep Torah. You keep the laws, the statutes, and the judgments of the Most High by what you hear coming forth from His gifts. Who's His gifts? His shepherds, His pastors, His teachers, His deacons, His elders, His leaders. You listen to the gifts that are brought before you. They're visually seen on videos. Submit your heart to them. You would be in consistent awareness of your body language. From the walking and the shaking of what you got or the shaking of what you wish you had, you would be in constant awareness of how you walk, how you sit, how you stand, how you move. You would deny lust. And you say, well, lust is a good thing, I thought. I thought we was all, okay, in context because the lust that you've been given as a seed that is grown in you based on your stimulation. The lust that you have inside of you is based on your exposure. The lust that you operate in is based on your Torah violations. Okay? So, I went to an anonymous, promiscuous sister with much character. And I had a great dialogue. And she said, I could share her conversation, and I won't go into great detail, but she's so converted from being promiscuous that she hates who she was, but yet is not condemned by it. Because even condemnation is a reminder of who you used to be. So are you free? There's no connection between her and the promiscuous lifestyle that she lived. There's no relation, she says, to who I was. Now, she says, now that I am who I am in Christ, even without full deliverance, she says. So she's not saying she's free from every demon or she's free from every thought or that she's free from every temptation. She's just saying she's so renewed in her mind that there's no relation to who she was. And she says, there's nothing in me to desire. There's, there's no uh, lust driving her. Now she has the mind that doesn't even want to dishonor her Heavenly Father. She's no longer in anarchy. Right? So she even says, when you do live promiscuous, that the world taints you. She's very young, and the world tainted her. And mother, she notices a spiritual difference between herself and the virgins that she's met in Torah, by the way, virgins she's met in Torah. Because there's a childlike, pure goofiness to them to where they don't deal with the rejections that she has to deal with. And I'm going to go to you, but let me share this part because we we all have our story When she was a little girl in public school, she was kissed by a teacher as a child. Maybe one time, maybe a hundred times, who knows, but he was lusting for her mother. So he began to kiss her. By 11 years old, she was addicted to pornography. And she literally didn't even know, she doesn't have a clue on how to be a virgin. She never knew. There was never a pureness that she was able to manifest. But yet she can have the testimony that her mind is converted, transformed, I should say. She hates who she was, and now there's no relation or connection. Mother Jennifer? You know, Sister Ashley, um, you reading the definition of anarchy really put me in the mind of, of, you know, we have to understand and acknowledge and truly remember that authority is always present. When you have a personal relationship with the Most High Yah, you know, Yah, we know he comes first, and and you get an understanding of his law when you understand who he is. And then you start to understand and and have a fear, um, a godly fear of those he has placed over you in authority. And so when you've read that definition, 
a state of disorder due to absence or non-recognition of authority. So we know that authority is always present. So it's you choosing to ignore it. You're not recognizing that authority. And that is getting into, you know, something completely different. I don't want to go too far the other way, but you have to um, really understand that if you are in this position of anarchy and you call yourself a a daughter of Sarah, a, a child of Yah, if you belong to him, then you are not recognizing his authority if you are making your own decisions and not following um, the structure that Yah has placed uh, before you. Sister Ashley? The anarchy definition or your understanding might be based on um, America's government, you know, the world system. So anarchy would be the lawlessness because of the breakdown in our government. So the things that would happen on the streets and the looting and the this and the that, when there's no one, there's no cop, there's no mayor, there's no governor, there's no one telling you this is the law. And so now we have the restoration of those things, and we have a covenant agreement with our creator and father that says, this is what I will do. And he says, well, this is my shepherd. This is the shepherd that has my heart, and this is who you're going to listen to. And this is what I'm going to restore to you. And we say, yay, and hallelujah, right? And so now we shouldn't have lawlessness because of a breakdown in our government, right? Because we we shouldn't have Torah violations. Yah forbid. It's being restored to us, okay? So who is our government, right? Who is our government? That's a a common uh, Christian uh, theology or question for Christians who come out. Let's go to... um, Let's go to 51 minutes into the same message last Shabbat. Obey them, all in the same context. They have a rule over you and submit, submit, submit. Now, let's see. Now, this submission is not just to those that have a rule over you. You're supposed to be submitting yourselves one to another in the fear. In the fear. Why? Because y'all said so. In the fear of y'all. For they watch for your souls, and they just must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For it is unprofitable for you. Look at verse 18. Pray for us, for we trust. We have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. How much more honest could you live if I was just as jacked up as some of you are? If I start justifying sin, you know this place could be turned into a house of ill repute at a snap of the hand. Yeah, it could. Because then you have reason and cause part and parcel to say, hey, look at them. See, today we have people who have so called been converted to the faith walking in different statuses from their previous Gentile lifestyle. The latest issue. We have these young men going outside of the council of myself and the elders and decided to take for themselves wives without going through the proper plural calls. You know what I'm- All right, Mother Jennifer, I'll go to you. You know, Sister Ashley, um, I think about Second uh, Peter 1, and I believe Pastor went over this on Sabbath. And, you know, it talks about um, giving all diligence. You know, and adding to our faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. And if you really slow down, really slow down and and really understand what this is saying and you look a little bit further, it says that he that lacketh these things is blind and can't see afar off. And he's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And in this message, Pastor mentions, um, you know, how we used to be in our, our previous life before coming to the faith and how we get into this place where we're repeating the old, the things of the old, 
you know, forgetting that you were purged from these old sins, but we're missing the the diligence, you know, adding to our faith the virtue and to our virtue knowledge and, you know, uh, temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity. But it really means a lot to go back and to look into these things and in private time truly ask the Father to help you to develop these things within you so that it can become a part of your character so that you can remember that you've been purged from the old, you know, that this is not you anymore at all. And it it even says if you do these things that you will never fall. And that is a promise in the book. We just have to really follow what it's telling us to do to even get to that point of never falling. Sister Ashley? And he asked a question, you know, just in paraphrase, like could could we still follow him or listen to him or, you know, give him our ear if he was acting out a character and doing some of the careless things that take place in our homes, in our hearts and lives? And the answer is no, absolutely not me. I'm speaking as a person. See, women that listen to us or tune in briefly or are brand new, they might believe that we're afraid to talk about certain things or discuss certain things. If Shepard asked me in secret or openly as he did this crowd, could I follow him if he was this, this, and this, and this? No, sir, no, pastor. I could not. If you were a glutton, if you were unstable, if you had a broken home, if you were an alcoholic or a molester, if you were careless or a smooth talker or a whoremonger, if you were given to lust, no, Shepard, I couldn't follow. Because, because he's not is how we can bear fruit. See, that's so pivotal in our understanding. Because he is not, we can have the vision to attain freedom, to gain liberty, to gain strength. That's how we can talk the way we talk from freedom. All right, let's go to another um, another clip. We're going to about 54, 54 minutes into the same message. See, it's hard dealing with the people who want to do that which is right in their own eyes. So today we are going to visit this in some great detail. Some think that we're just making up stuff as we go. And as we go, others follow us and our rules, laws, customs, traditions. We just make sure that our laws, customs, and traditions are not in opposition with y'all. We don't make laws like, well, you got to wash your hands before you eat. Which I might add, does not conflict with the laws of y'all. In other words, the things that we say, it don't conflict with the law of y'all. It's just that you become, you're so carnal. So we have to address this so all Israel know. The way that myself and the elders think. Argument number one. Sisters who come to us from the world, which have been very promiscuous, meaning they have had multiple sex partners and have produced children of whoredoms. That's exactly what they are. Children of whoredoms. Law of seduction. Shemot 22, 16. We're going to visit this twice. Back to back, if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed, what's her status? She's not betrothed. And lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. Wife. Now watch this. The way we interpret it today, okay, good. You know what? <clears throat> I'm already, she's already mine. Well, if a father utterly refuses... See, so today what we do is, well, that ain't her natural father. Well, you got to pick which one you're going to walk after. You're going to walk after the flesh or after the spirit. Because over here in the flesh, you had fathers, and you disrespect and dishonor them and give a damn about what they said. And even though and your father probably could have been jacked up as hell, didn't even follow the law, statutes, and commandments of Yahweh. Didn't even care. Over here, 
You've got fathers that care a lot about you. See, we want to pick and choose which way we're going in this thing. See, right here, if we just stick with this, oh, she's my wife. But if a father ugly refused to give it unto her, and look at it, it says, if a man touches a maid, a maid, that's just a woman. Refuses to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of what? Virgins. A lot of stipulations in here. Don't let any misunderstandings of the law that he's discussing in Exodus 22 steer you away from where we're going, okay? He's just taking a taking a little moment for this, and we're gonna we're gonna head back to another thought, okay? So keep keep your focus, please, my sisters, if this is helping you at all. How do we know that this woman hadn't already been molested? We don't know if this woman has been in the field, cried out, and somebody took her. There's me. But then you still have to pay the price of what? Virgins. Now, let's bring his own up till the day then. We just got to talking about natural and spiritual. Did we? Flesh, spirit. Is that right? So which one is it going to be? If you're a whore and whoremonger over here, and now you claim to be born again, that means you are new. You've been washed by the blood. Is that right? That means you become a new creature. Is that right? You become a new creature. Is that right? We didn't say that the law don't make provisions for when you crap on yourself, because it does. But since we ain't got nobody to teach us how to do this, somebody's going to have to lead the charge. So how you fuse this, this, this side and bring it on over here until you become quickened and become this person, this brand new person in the side like y'all want you to be? So then what we do, we get over here, we can still see the residue, we can still see the baggage of your previous form of lifestyle, yet we don't view you that way. That's why we give you the honor, woman, by putting you under an authority figure or a headship. Does that make any sense? Whereas before you didn't have no father, over here we try to give you a father. All right, Mother Jennifer, explain how each of us have a father. Sister Ashley, we are, um, every single woman in this ministry is covered. Like Pastor talked about the authorities that have been um, put in place by the Most High God. So we have shepherds, we have elders, uh, we have deacons, we have those who just truly watch over us. But I think we forget that, you know, there there is a stipulation. We have to obey there are rules and there are laws and there are things that are put in place that need to be obeyed. It's not just the the married women that are covered. We're, we're all married to um, the most high. And so it's not, you know, a, a matter of having um, an earthly husband that's here. We are all married. We are all brides. And so we are all covered but we have to really obey. And I, I wanted to go back to uh, when Pastor talked about um, early on, he said, you know, we have a presumption that we understand the law. So we're so presumptuous to think that we even have an understanding of the law. And before coming this way, none of us had a true understanding of the law at all. Um, and that's why we were delivered here. We were brought here. Uh, to be under the direction and the guidance of a Jeremiah 315 pastor so that we could gain understanding. But if we think that we are um, understanding the law, then we're operating under presumption. You know, we're operating in our own self-will and, and we operate in our own understanding. And I really like when pastor talked about, you know, when you come in that, they can discern the baggage of your previous lifestyle, but they never view you that way. You're never treated that way. And it, it, is, it is so true. You're always seen for the freedom. You know, um, 
that can be obtained. You're always seen as a free person, but we just have to let go of the bondage of the past. People are already viewing you as free, but you have to view yourself as free as well. Sister Ashley? Right. And he called my child a child of whoredoms. How dare he? Right? You might say, you might have this sort of hearing when you hear our government speak to us, but when you hear those thoughts from inside of you, it isn't based on your repented heart. You can't hear his love and you can't hear his truth because of your offense. And why are you offended? Because you've been in Torah violation and it's hardened you. And because Torah violation has hardened you, you've had to defend yourself. You've been outside of the covering of the government, and you've been in anarchy. Torah violations uh, concerning sexual laws, of course, promiscuity is one of them. It's a result of exposure. So promiscuity is an exposure to maybe even public school, maybe unlawful family members, maybe movies or videos, something initiated you to be that way. It could have been molestation. But being promiscuous is a Torah violation. Rape is a Torah violation. Adultery, a willful act against the Torah. Incest, a willful act against the Torah. He just broke down the law of seduction or or enticement, which is a man who would take uh, a maid or a woman away from her father and into his arms or into even another nation, another way of thought. I'm going to pull up this book here. Uh, Can you grab the email? That you're going to read tonight, Mother Jennifer, and we'll go there next. Um, So we we read an example of a sister's thoughts, or I didn't read, I'm sorry, I just reiterated in a conversation that I had with a previous promiscuous woman um, that shared her heart and her differences in who she is now with much freedom. Um, And then we'll also read an email from a rape victim who has also transformed her mind. Right, so we are uh, women who are, uh, let's say it like this, Mother Jennifer, let's take a moment before I go to this rape definition in, in this book I have. Um, you know, as, as we go forward in the spirit, I can understand how this flesh manifestation, this sensual, sexual, devilish desire, and this lust is to the zenith in our culture through the imagery and just through the um, the addictions that people have to feel good, to, to temporary releases, you know. Um, and so joining what the Father is trying to do to us with what the world is, is, the way it's going, it just makes sense that these things have to be brought out to the forefront. We come from a generation where everything was hush-hush. Your mom didn't teach you how to clean yourself, and your mom didn't teach you about your, your flowers, Your mom didn't teach you about your value because she didn't have any. And so now the father, you might say, it's the foolishness of Yah to actually restore a woman to her value from a black man teaching and preaching polygyny that you believe is lust. And interesting that you would consider him being supportive of the devaluing of a woman by teaching polygyny. It's a big hang-up. I understand. So you have this black man in front of us teaching polygyny, and you're saying he's justifying lust, but yet Yah's using the foolishness of preaching to free his people. So... The proof of polygyny not being a Torah of violation is in the innocence of this ministry and the fruit of this ministry, the healing. So, Mother Jennifer, how can such a seemingly lustful lifestyle be so healing? You know, Sister Ashley, when you truly gain understanding of Yah's ways and his law, you experience healing. You truly do. And it's just like the enemy to uh, want to distort the the law of, of Yah. And Torah is the thing that is going to set you free. Torah is the thing that is going to truly provide healing. That's why, you know, we're told great peace has they which love thy law and nothing shall offend you. So when you 
can grasp the law, you can grasp Torah, then you can truly be set free and you don't have the offenses that you've had in the world in the world and you can truly learn what it means to be set free because you've gained you're starting to truly gain understanding of our culture you know how our culture um was created and and just everything the values and everything that our culture rests on when you gain understanding of that then you can truly be free sister ashley well said thank you so uh, I'm going to a quote here that I have a book. Uh, thank you to Sister Tanasa, uh, who had turned me on to this book's existence. Rape is an unjust and sick pattern of behavior. It is a behavior pattern reflective of very low levels of self-respect and mental illness. Rape manifests very low levels of respect towards others. It is a horrendous violation of the selfhood of another. The most frequent form of rape is that in which a male aggressively and abusively imposes himself into a female with the threat of destruction. Often someone considered physically weaker or vulnerable by someone who at least superficially looks upon himself as more powerful and capable of subduing subduing someone else. Now, here's a statistic before she goes to the email, because we're going to an email of what the world would say a black female, okay, quote says, in today's world, rape is common. In the United States, it is reported in highest incidence among members of the black population, with black males raping black females. There is said to be approximately equal instance of white males raping black females as black males raping white females. That's interesting. I'm going to say it again. There's said to be approximately equal incidence of white males raping black females as there are black males raping white females. The incidence of white males raping white females is lowest. In past decades, white male rape of black females was the highest incidence ever. Okay, so what was the highest? White male rape of black females. Interesting. Let's go to a rape victim, if we can say that, in years earlier in her life. Now she's in Torah. And because I know her so personally, you would never know that she carried or ever carried these scars. This is a a woman of great integrity. Go ahead, Mother Jennifer. Okay, she says at the tender young age of nine, I was molested by my 16-year-old brother. Later in life, I dealt with rape as a freshman and junior in college. This left my mind in a state of passivity to deal with the attacks and a lack of understanding the true value of my being. As a young woman that was raised and reared actively in the Christian church with the father as a preacher, I was taught to cover everything up. There was so much that was not addressed in the church that I couldn't even define what a virgin was until I was no longer one. It had no value to me. The stigma of the world was that it was a problem or immaturity that a woman had to rid herself of. No one wanted to date a virgin. As I grew in my desire to have a true relationship with Yah, that I knew as God then, I knew that I was supposed to be with one man that I could marry and give all of myself to. My state of mind was that if I gave all to that man, he would love me and I would find value in that. I found my value in achieving all that was expected of me from everyone. I never wanted anything in return because that would leave me vulnerable to their judgment, and I couldn't handle that. I would give everyone counsel and felt the need to be strong to handle everyone's burdens. I was a serial monogamous because I didn't want to be classified as a whore because of what I had been through. If I had a list of expectations for a man, I made sure I matched those expectations so I would be desired by that type of man. 
I thought this made me a good catch. Being lustful in my mind was the farthest thing from my thoughts. I disconnected myself in intimacy, taking everything personally to keep from being devalued. I would see it as a job instead of a beautiful event. Then I got married and this mind frame became a great problem. I lacked vulnerability vulnerability in this area. I was unable to make the connection. In coming into the faith, I met some beautiful daughters of Zion that were virgins. They had the mindset of true submission and portrayed true honor and respect for the gift they had. I wanted that. I wanted to feel the value that had been stolen from me. I wanted that from my daughters. In order to get that, I had to purge all that wickedness that had fragmented my soul and created this broken vessel. I had to admit my shortcomings and filth and work to rid myself of it. I knew I was without excuse because my pastor, Pastor Dow, a true Jeremiah 315 pastor that took away all of my excuses on how to be made whole and be presented before my Yah as a chaste virgin, with exceeding joy. So I was not going to allow anything to stop me from achieving that reconciliation. You see, it was not about me. I need to be the example that my daughters can follow, not just hear my words, but follow my actions. So I dug deep and put the work in. I let my love for Yah overcome my will. I believed his word, and he taught me the desires of my heart through the loving guidance of my husband. It was tough work because I realized that I had broken Torah by not crying out. I should have received justice for what happened to me, but my fear of people and their thoughts of me opened me up to that passive mindset which caused me to sin against my Yah. I had to deal with that through forgiveness of my ignorance and let it fuel my fire to overcome that state of being. It caused a righteous anger that pushed me to put the work in to be Yah's vessel of honor, his Proverbs 31 woman, to fight daily to be holy through his mercies that are new every morning. I was able to forgive myself and everyone else. I was able to remove my lustful desires for those of Yah. I chose life as I allowed the Holy Spirit to transform my mind to the mind, will, way, and the righteousness of Yah. I realized that it was greater than me. Then Yah showed me how valuable I am to him, how to truly measure my value in the blessings that make my spirit rich and add no sorrow. I experienced peace, joy, and love so great through trials and tribulations that I was never going to give them up. So I walk in the newness of life. No fleshly lust is worth my peace and joy. I am forever grateful. And I show this by being a servant unto my master. I treat him the way I would treat my master, Yahweh. That way he knows by my deeds that I am truly grateful for his restoration of my soul and value. My dear sisters, you want to know how to keep yourself in Yah? Love him above all with your complete spirit, soul, will, and mind. His promises are that he will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him and truly trust in him. Then, as his heart safely trusts in you, he will bless you with the desires of your heart. I pray this helps heal the heart of some woman listening to this letter today. A woman submitted to one man is a testimony that she can submit to one Yah. How we treat that man is how we truly feel about our Yah. Whether single or married, we are under authority in Israel. So a woman can act like a virgin or a whore. The choice is up to her. Bless you, my beloved friend. Shalom. Sister Ashley. Hallelujah. And this is a woman in a polygynous relationship currently in Torah who doesn't speak as a victim. You hear it from her, right? You hear the strength. She doesn't demand pity, constantly reliving her past for the attention of others. 
you know, constantly wanting uh, her rejection soothed. I hope this is uh, seeking in. You know, we live according to the word that says, you know, I'm, I'm determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we don't know each other's past unless we share our overcoming testimonies. Um, it's interesting that, you know, a spiritual dynamic that happens is as we glorify virgins who keep themselves, then automatically a spirit gets ushered in into the minds of those who didn't keep themselves, and you're condemned. That's not what it's about. That's, that's telling you you haven't faced your rejection. We should be able to praise one another for the examples that we are. We should be able to praise one another for the stories that we have, the same way that you may be um, a, a single mother and doing a, a awesome job homeschooling your children or uh, you might be uh, uh, whatever your circumstance is. We should be able to praise you the same way that we can say, look at this woman who is saving herself, who saved her body. So I said to a, a virgin, what made you save yourself? She wasn't. She didn't grow up in the way. What made you save yourself? You know what she said? If I was out there in the world for one more year, I probably wouldn't have. That's pretty powerful. But yet she did. It doesn't take away from the strength that she carried. Yah kept her. So I really admire the examples of virgin women that we have. I'm not condemned. I don't need to run around and say, um, I was raped just to get each of you to engage with me so we can go back and forth and understand one another. It's not about that at all. Um, go ahead, Mother Jennifer, your thoughts. You know, Sister Ashley, I, I really like um, in the letter how this sister refused to remain a victim and I think that is, is very, very important. She refused to remain a victim. And she loved Yah over um, anything, any feelings that would try to rationalize in her mind uh, remaining a victim. You know, she loved her children. She said, I had to be the example. So she was being taught, but she understood that I have to walk this out so that my daughters can be free as well. So um, that really stands out to me, the fact that she went to Torah and um, acknowledged her wrong. You know, when, when you think about the testimony, you wouldn't think that she needed to repent for anything. You know, that's what your natural mind would say. But she was able to go to Torah and to lovingly get the understanding that she needed so that she didn't remain a victim and she didn't remain in a state of blaming um, everyone else. And now, as a result, today she's a free woman. Sister Ashley? I admire her selflessness, too, that was expressed when she said, you know, she didn't want her daughters um, to experience the same thing, uh, not just the rape, but the, the mental um, difference between thinking the way she used to think and thinking how she is now. Yah, my sister, has to, he doesn't have to, I don't say it as a command, but Yah is the one that is able to restore his pure intentions of intimacy to you. Yah restores pure intentions of intimacy to you based on how you hear, the freedom you want. We have circumstances often where um, incubus is a, is a situation. It's a male demon that has sex with sleeping women. His name is Incubus. You don't got to get eerie of straightway because we expose Incubus. People want to be free from Incubus. So they've been here. They've called here. They've, they've visited. They come to get free. You can, I, I, one of the first, uh, when I really try to dive into the spirit to try to help free those who are bound, one of the first testimonies I've mentioned before on the show was an actual virgin, 16 years old, I found her on YouTube sitting in her car. Y'all help me. I believe she was 16. She's still saying, I'm a virgin. I've never been touched by a man, and I have a male demon, Incubus, visit me since I was a little girl. So 
so she understands the feelings that a man should be giving her. Well, how do you how do you help her? How do you how do you you know how do you lead sisters who are free? Because some of you may be bound by that. It's a male demon who comes um, onto you, onto your body, in different parts to stimulate your senses. It is always a generational curse. You'll rack your mind because of your promiscuity. You'll rack your mind trying to figure out how it got in and how it keeps coming, and you'll you'll try to do all this math, but it comes because of sins of the forefathers. It persists because of your desires. Okay, it's just like Pastor says you wanna, you know, you wanna figure out what your ancestors did. You don't gotta look too far back. You know, they were alcoholics, they were um, molesters, whatever. You, you know, the sin that tempts you and your members is oftentimes what your ancestors were tempted by. We're bound by spiritual laws that he would, um, you know, bless those who love him and curse those who didn't to many generations, to our children and our, and our children's children. So Incubus, yes, is a male demon that needs to be cast out and needs to be broken off. I wouldn't suggest you doing it on your own um, because it is a very, very powerful presence. Going back to virginity, it was embarrassing in my high school to be a virgin. I would avoid the conversation because of no experience. That's what this email states. You know, she didn't want to be vulnerable to their judgments. That's the that's the pressure of this society and this culture. I can only imagine what it's like to any of you. And some of some of us, 40, 50, and on, might be a you know, that's not who y'all trying to really get this message to. He's trying to get it to, to the pure generation, the one that's going to, you know, raise up the next seed. That's who impresses me anyway. But if you have a spirit of lust or you're lust-driven, you have to hate it. Mother Jennifer, teach them what I mean by you have to hate the thing that is tempting you. Go ahead. You know, Sister Ashley, you start to develop a hatred for the things that Yahweh hates. So we understand that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And when you desire to please him, you desire to hate the sin that he hates. So things that we don't view as sin, when you start to develop a love for the Most High Yah, he will show you what sin is, things that you have made excuses for in the past, you will start to see that these things are sin and these are things that, that Yahweh hates. So you develop a hatred for that because you realize that it separates you from him. And anything that brings separation, anything that brings division is something that you hate and you actually stay away from. And Sister Ashley, you talked about, um, you know, deliverance, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, deliverance is very, very important if you're dealing with any of these things. Deliverance is so important. And repentance on behalf of those in your generational line. You know, you talked about um, sins of, of your ancestors. You're going to have to look in your generational line, and you'll need to repent on behalf of those that are in that line. You can't just say, well, it's something that, um, my uncle did, or it's something that my aunt did, and you you can't take a passive approach and think that you don't need to go before the Father and repent and get that right. You know, it has to stop with you. So um, deliverance, you know, when you're talking about deliverance, it is, it's very important as women to be able to build trust with one another, and I believe a lot of times we become so... Uh, embarrassed and so ashamed and so um, non-trusting of each other that we're afraid to go to each other for deliverance. And that is not the way that you're going to be set free. So this is why it's so important to develop relationships together as women so that we can experience the freedom and the deliverance that will truly set us free. Sister Ashley? 
Hallelujah. Let's uh, stay on the word repentance for a moment because maybe your wheels are turning and you know it's necessary for you, but, you know, it can't be just the surface level repentance. Like, um, please forgive me for this. And you can dig deeper into what this is by determining your subconscious behavior and how it drives you. I mentioned earlier how you walk, right, how you walk different around men, how you change your behavior in the presence of men. You have to pay attention to subconscious behavior. You get louder or friendlier in the presence of men. You laugh and smile only around men. And the spirit of lust manifest by tingling of your hands, tingling of your lips, tingling of your nose and your vagina. And typically, lust is driven by your addiction to a feeling that you can't control. So you have to get control over the feeling that you're addicted to. For some, that addiction and that feeling is just for the climax. But for some, it's the Band-Aid to cover your rejection. I want to feel this so that my rejection is suppressed a little longer. And with all these problems and mental behaviors that we have based on sexual exposure and stimulation, how can you understand Yah or his men in the mental state that you're in? And I don't say that in defeat or to lay a a judgment. I'm saying you are scrambled in your mind to try to grasp what, what, how does Yah think and how he considers this and what's his way and what's his law and why all these questions that you may have, you can't get answers without a repented heart. Because without repentance, there's a hardened surface on the exterior of your heart that just won't allow his truth to penetrate you. So why do you burn? Only you would know. Here's an interesting um, correlation between slavery and sexual immorality. In this book that I have, it's actually um, kind of a higher read, so I'll take it slow and I'll try to explain because, you know, me being the one that has read it, I understand it in context, so I don't want to present something to your mind that you can't understand. So give me just a moment to read it first, my sisters, and I hope I can help you understand. And Mother Jennifer, I know you can. It says, when slavery ended, black women and men welcomed their newly acquired freedom to express sexuality. Okay, so remember, you take a people, you take them from who they are, you throw them in this culture, you rape them and you beat them, and then boom, when it's over, express your sexuality. So it says, like the early white colonizers, the masters, black folks were without any social order to govern or restrain their sexual behavior, so they indulged themselves. It must have been for a good feeling. Suddenly they have the freedom to choose a sexual partner and to behave in whatever manner they desired. Some black women exercised their newfound sexual freedom by engaging freely in sexual relationships with many black men. Whites saw this sexual activity of female slaves as further evidence to support their claim that black women were just sexually loose and morally depraved. See, proverbs and bywords everywhere. What that's meaning is white people or white systematic um, spirits, whatever you want to say, saw black women as sexually loose and morally deprived because now they're functioning in a response to what has been done to them. It reads, they choose to ignore the fact that the great majority of black women and men attempted to adapt values and behavior patterns but were controlled by whites. So it was a struggle everywhere you turn. It says during the years of black reconstruction, okay, black reconstruction just basically means, hey, slavery's over and now the blacks are on, if you even want to say somewhat of a rise, 
right? Still a, a, a hoax, but black reconstruction is, okay, black people were given freedom, so-called freedom. It says black women struggled to change negative images of black womanhood that was perpetuated by whites, trying to dispel the myth that all black women were sexually loose. So how did they try to dispel the myth that all black women were sexually loose, especially if they weren't, right? It says here they emulated the conduct and the mannerisms of white women. Here's another thought it says. In the eyes of the white public, this is a woman's comment, she would never be seen as worthy of consideration or respect. In the eyes of the white public, she would never be seen as worthy of consideration or respect. This is the life we live in. Ingrained in the DNA of many of you and, and so prevalent at this time as well. But when you're considering repentance, and when you're considering behavior that you don't even know where it derives from, it's just an interesting point. It's an interesting point for connection because you have to deny self-hate. You have to deny self-hate that even stems from white America that's still being perpetuated. How can you say, as a black woman, I want to rise and be loved and be valued when white America is still oppressing me? You have to do it in Yah. You have to do it through his obedience. You have to be restored. Do you hate yourself because of white imagery, white sorcery? Probably, right? You, do you have to forgive white man? Yes. Do you have to forgive black man? Yes. you got to really back this thing up, Mother Jennifer. You're a melanated woman. Add to it, please. You know, Sister Ashley, there's so much... Um like you said, imagery, there, there's so much that's put out there subliminally to um, impose a, a hatred, a self-hatred um, for not just for black women, but for women, period. There's so much trauma, so much rejection, so much bondage um, that has been experienced. And so when you're able to make your own decisions, as you, you know, people think that you're making your own decisions when you're able to um, exercise that freedom, then you run with it just to receive any level of gratification, just to be able to hide that trauma or that rejection or that bondage, that lack of freedom, not knowing that you're really putting more bondage into your heart um, than you think you are. So you think that you're really covering up um, or healing a wound, but but it's, it's really not. You're wounding yourself even more because of all of these subliminal things that are put out there for women to 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 just hate themselves. Sister Ashley? Very good. These are good points to think on, my sisters, especially to the level that I know y'all can free you. Satan hates his truth. To the level that I know y'all can heal you because I'm free and I'm healed, I know he hates his truth. Don't let nothing keep you from hearing. This woman that wrote this book says a colored woman's virtue in this part of the country has no protection. So a colored woman's virtue, okay, cover up for what? You're still going to be taken around the corner. You're still going to be called all kinds of names. Black women were often coerced into sexual liaisons with white employees, right, who would threaten to fire them unless they did the sexual demands. So these are things to consider. Are white people considered dirty? No, unless what? Unless she's a white woman laying with a black man in this country. And that's that's the life we live in. And maybe depending on where you're from, your circumstance might be different. Maybe maybe you don't have this exposure. I do, right? As a white person, you're clean, you're uppity, and you're upright, and you're flawless unless you're involved with black black men, black people, black women. So it's it's a, a dominating, oppressive spirit that's trying to captivate on your weakness, on the proverb and the byword and the Deuteronomy 28, and it's trying to glorify itself by using your body as its vessel. It's disgusting. So white women would rather their white man, in this day that I read about here, white women would rather their white man lay with a three-fifths human than a white friend. So that jacked up white women's minds, 
jealous, envious, insecure, fearful? Mother? You know, Sister Ashley, even when you look at... um, when you look at the the behavior of women, and there are so many women who are um, acting out with masculine behaviors, you know, and it's it's really um, so out of character for who we've create, been created to be. And you mentioned, you know, not covering your body, not covering yourself up, and everything that the devil has really put out there is so opposite and contrary to the way that Yah intended it to be. If we really just dig into the word and see um, how Yah has outlined everything for us as women, you'll see that the world has taught us the complete opposite. And it it really is a a coping mechanism. If you have a a woman that is acting out in a a nature that is masculine, it's a coping mechanism. You know, you're trying to cope um, for the rejection that you've experienced or the trauma that you've experienced of, of being a woman. If you are showing your body off, you're coping, you're trying to cope. It's a, a coping mechanism to try to cover up rejection that you've experienced as a woman. So everything has a reason. There's a motive and an intent and a reason behind everything. And remember, we're going to be judged by the intent. So this is why it's so important to uncover um, and unmask the intent of why you do what you do, why you're in the position that you're in so that you can truly be set free. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. You are trying to cope with the lack of a father. That's the that's the premises for all of this. The lack of a father, the lack of a patriarch. That's why, the, you know, the, yes, this ministry is very male-driven, but it's Yah's regimen. Yah's regimen is to restore the father into each home or the covering over the woman so that you would heal. Every one of us who didn't have a father or lost a father, etc., it was the beginning of a, a tragic story. A tragic story. So you can't even restore the covenant to a people without the father in the house. I don't mean in your house as a woman that may have single children or, or a woman who is not covered. I just mean within Israel, we function as one body, one spirit, one mind. You must have the patriarch and the father. Satan is determined to place men versus women in all competitions, in all ways of life, to compete, to outscore, to out to out-succeed to undermine and destroy one another. The very foundation of Yah's creation, which was a woman was created to help meet a man's needs. That's very far from the thought process in most of us because who was a father? What's his job? Huh? What's his role? He's supposed to correct, huh? He's supposed to guide me, correct me, me, tell me what to do. And so you have no order and you have disarray and you have anarchy and you're just disobedient and we're not crying over spilt milk and we're not saying anything about excuses because we're reading testimonies of women who have changed who have overcome who are free it's Yah's restoration so opposition to us as women as I said earlier there's two types of women listening to this broadcast I promise you there's one that's going to be holy strive get free and be uh, even more of a saint and a sister than she ever was and then there's one that's promiscuous by nature and she doesn't understand her own heart and she's going to resist so those two forces are going to oppose one another because we're always going to be up against the Hasatan I have Pastor Corey on the line pardon me for ever keeping you holding I'll see if it's Pastor or maybe even someone from his house. It's area code 816. Air code 816, Pastor Corey or family, shalom. Shalom, shalom, family, shalom. This this is Pastor Corey. Shalom. Uh, shalom. Here. Hallelujah. I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm listening in, you know, and it just, I just, you know, walked out of the gym and I'm tuning in as I'm, you know, heading home, and here's the, the the whole gist of why I had to cut in. 
I we, we're getting ready to talk about, you know, what's existing and what's underlying in saints, particularly, you know, we're getting ready to talk about the mothers, we're gonna talk about the sisters, you know, the you know, um brothers. And what Mother Jennifer just said is that we tend to produce actions that mask and it just it just rung the bell as loud as it can ring it in my head. Because here I want, you know, saints, sisters, I want you you all to really hear this point. See, you know, there's a measuring read. There's a spectrum that is found in the book under the guidance of fruits of the Spirit. And so if we begin to hold that up next to to saints, you know, when they're in the well, when they're directly in the act of producing a unfruitful work, and you would ask them, why are you producing this action right now in this time, in this moment? And what you find, they give you the answer that masks what they're doing, but they, they forget that there's a measuring read that says, you know, do you, do you have peace or patience, you know, or, or are you full of joy, or, you know? And then we forget that when we have a countenance that displays whether or not we are walking in the fruits of the Spirit, it tells on us. But regardless, we still produce these actions as if people – or those who are of a discerning of spirits don't see it. And so it's so powerful that we're driving this point home because if we truly want to be set free, Mother Jennifer and Sister Ashley, you know, that's where, you know, when we when the book says don't try to get the moat out of somebody else's eye, when we look, we got this huge of a boulder, we have this huge of a tree trunk coming out of our own eye and can't see it. See, and this is where a lot of us miss it because we, we don't go up under the self-evaluation to see why are we, why are we producing these actions? I know that's, that's what I, I'm talking to the saints from that standpoint because it, it's in line with this. When I came to this ministry, I came knowing that I was jacked up. I, I came knowing that if this is a ministry that's following the Messiah, then it, there's deliverance from what's in me causing me to continue to act and produce things the way I produce them. See, as a man, you know, in the world, there's many things that I mask so that I can cover up the hurt of not having a father, the hurt of not being taught things concerning manhood, you know, because see, when you have people that grow up and you, you make your own way, you grow up, uh, you know, in, in the, the neighborhood or in the hood, then many men that are without guidance are guiding them with the guidance that they made up, that they performed. So are there women who are not good mothers, who are, who don't understand what it, you know, if there was a such thing as being ladylike, then they, they, they didn't know how to be ladylike. You, so, in essence, then you find some of these actions that we're going to address here in Kansas City here on after Sabbath, and, and we, we're going to go and tear down a lot of these walls. That's the intent that we're going to do. We tear down a lot of walls because we see things, and we're not going to let you hide in it, you know, even though you're masking it. We're going to point directly to it and so what you've done tonight and, and what this is doing this is pointing directly to some of those things especially when we talk when you said that we dress a certain way to mask being rejected or having 
rejection, and that that goes with many other actions. So I just wanted to come in and and just you know give Yah the glory that that type of wisdom is coming forth, so that we can continue to expose the the kingdom of of the, the what Satan is trying to do in causing us to produce evil actions that are that is not in line with striving to be set apart and holy. So bless you all. Well, I, I, I'm thankful for being able to just come in and, and and you know come alongside that which you have said, Mother Jennifer and, and Sister Ashley. Bless you well. Hallelujah. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you so much for your call. Hallelujah. All right. Um, I have two clips from Pastor Corey. I was you was gonna hear his voice tonight, whether he called in or not. I too am very thankful for a dialogue like this because we uh we deal with demons, you know. We don't suppress things. We're we're overcomers, we're victorious. The destruction of a female's value is an immediate result of Torah violation. Remember that. The destruction of a female's value is an immediate result of Torah violation. So I praise Yah for his restoration and his Torah. Now, opposition says if a man's will is done, Mother Jennifer, what he wants and how many he wants, and he's, he's this, this, that, and the other, because you've been so rejected and done wrong by men, that you don't understand that it's attracting you to more of them. So if a man's will is done, then the woman says, well, my voice is meaningless and my will is squashed and my pain increases and he can get over on me and he can get what he wants. But my sisters, with much sincerity, you can't view the men of this world around you and your job and your city and your family. You can't Continue to watch them, marry yourself after them, long for them, lust for them, um, you know, observe them, and even begin to grasp Yah's perfect family plan from a righteous man, which there is more than one in the ministry. Shepherd is out there taking the hit for all of us, but he's building men. Yah is building men through him. So um, I wanted to... You know, if you have mental scars of rape and promiscuity, just lay it out there with Yah. You know, do do the checklist. You know, what 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 do I what is my value? And if my value in Him, as our email said, is my obedience to my Master, then what is your value? Job says the price of wisdom is above rubies. So if you got some wisdom, that's above rubies. We got to start thinking like our Yah. Um, I wanted to read uh, this verse really quick. Mother Jennifer, do you have any thoughts? Go ahead. I wanted to say, Sister Ashley, that, you know, um, you brought up a really good point. Um, I remember Pastor teaching on this um, about women punishing men who are actually righteous because they've never properly dealt with men from their past. They've never dealt with the trauma of their past. So when you've never dealt with um, a traumatic experience that you've had with a man from the past, then you're going to punish a righteous man because you're going to see them all the same. And remember, everything starts with unforgiveness. You have to deal with unforgiveness first and foremost. Um, A lot of times people want to make deliverance out to be something that is extremely complicated. But if you start with deliverance or start with unforgiveness and deliverance, the Father will lead you um, as far as which way you need to go next. But you always have to start with unforgiveness. You can never skip past that at all. Sister Ashley? Very good. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Your character as a servant and a help me will restore everything taken from you. And, yes, you have to forgive. So if sex is a job. This is all the, this is the mindsets we're, we're up against because of the sensual, devilish, sexual culture that we're in. If sex is a job or a disgrace or it's disgusting or maybe to you it's a powerful expression of some kind of control that you have, have over your husband because he needs you and you're so special to him or maybe it's an addiction to a feeling or, or whatever it is to you, you've you got to clean this up. 
you don't you don't have to because we're talking about it by any means. Most of the people who wouldn't clean it up already clicked off anyway. All right, so I'm going back to, you know, uh, I'm going to go to Ciroc. In this particular, I have two more sound uh, sound clips. Um, Pastor Corey, Straightway Kansas City. Go subscribe, check him out. Um, it was streamed on March 15, 2020. Uh, our leaders deal with a lot of circumstances, uh, a lot of situations, you know, and, and keep things with integrity, by the way, and don't expose things to the people purposely because it's not meant for us to change our behavior towards one another. We are to love one another and let them handle the matters. But he had read a couple of verses from Sirach, and he says, Do you have daughters? Be concerned for their chastity. Okay? The word tells him as a father, just using him for an example, but any man or any father, that if you have a daughter, be concerned for their chastity. What is chastity? It's deliberately refraining from having sex. comes from a Latin word meaning morally pure. Be concerned for her purity, her moral purity, her sexual liberty. Be concerned. Okay, then it says, do not show yourself too indulgent with them, okay, as a daughter. So that's just from a man's perspective. They have their laws that they have to abide by. It says, give a daughter in marriage and you complete a great task but give her to a sensible man. Now, as a wife, you can't, um, you can't relate to what a father feels or his protection that he has or his concern that he has. You, we just can't. Okay, but that's the type of men that are leading us. So he is just coming off of reading those verses in Sirach, and I kind of wanted to move forward. Um, we're going to start at about 9 minutes and 38 seconds into, sadly, the title of the video is Silly Damn Women Part Kazillion. And though it's humorous, he really goes into the behavior that is suspect, that is perpetual, continual. Uh, someone is always doing it, if I can say that. And he's talking about silly damn women, okay? Um, don't be offended by any means. Please hear with clarity. My sister's here with love. All right, let's listen for a second. Do what it says, right? Watch this. I got a question as I read this. I got a question for you. It says, keep straight watch over a headstrong dog. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Why, why, why does that keep straight watch? I never read it say keep straight watch over a son. Now, the same sexist, racist, None of your politically correct things that you want to use to justify why I'm, at, why I am asking this question. But why does it say keep strict watch over a headstrong daughter? Well, I'm watching. I'm watching something right now that's unfolding, that's taking place, and you can't even do it the right way. You're doing it in foolishness. That's what I'm saying. Why go do something foolish when you got all the ample opportunity to do it right and do it correct? You know, like I told some of these other sisters that, that flew out of here, that now you, you eight babies in, ten babies in, thirty babies in, three in, whatever you in. I told you. You allow somebody that ain't planted and rooted in Yah, first of all. The word is not flowing through these people, because otherwise they would be wise enough not to allow you to make a foolish decision. The second thing is, if I find a wife, I'm going to get her. Guess what? I went to my wife's father's house. I talked to him. I stood before his family. I went and got her. Just like Brother Kabir came here and he got Sister Bruce. Hallelujah, Mother Jennifer. You know, Sister Ashley, this is why it is so um, important as women to understand that we are covered. Um, you know, we talk about daughters, headstrong daughters, and I have seen um, and experienced women that were 
in this ministry. They're no longer here, but I have experienced women trying to be friends with their daughters, and it never, never, ever works out well. You know, as mothers, we are not called to be friends with our daughters. We're called to be mothers. Um, Your daughters are going to desire to have you as a parent. You can't be their friend. And so we lack understanding when it comes to um, the word, and this is so important. It's why we have to be taught so that we can know and understand that you cannot be a friend to your daughter. You can't joke and play, you know, just make light of things that are uh, rebellious within them. You have to really address it, and you have to show them the way. And you have to make sure that you don't have rebellion in you first and foremost, and that you're not expecting something out of them that you're not requiring of yourself. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. Let me go back to this book for a moment. It says, The Significance of the Rape of Enslaved Black Women was not simply that it deliberately crushed their sexual integrity, but that it led to the devaluing of black womanhood and it permediated the psyche of all Americans. All right, so the enslaved black woman that was considered of little worth and of very little value, the proverb and the byword that she was, the the image that was created of her, of the fallen woman, the whore, the slut, the prostitute, etc., that still permediates America, it created my sisters, it created sexist and racist dialogue. But then you have the purity of speech and the purity of restoration of law and government and Torah being restored to speak of these things, to address these circumstances, to say, stop perpetuating the thing that your people have walked in, and it's whites too, but then you want to say it's racist or sexist. That's what we get. That when we address the concern and come, our shepherd comes from the word and the Bible, then we get accused of the very agenda that has created the issue, if that makes sense. So I hope that helps someone to understand. It's not us perpetuating this behavior, not that we have to apologize. It says here, the designation of all black women as sexually depraved and immoral and loose had its roots in the slave system. The devaluation of black womanhood occurred as a result of sexual exploitation of black women during slavery that is not altered in hundreds of years. What a sadness. And so you as a woman, white or black, doesn't matter. We're not a we're not a race we're not racist, nor does color an issue, but for circumstance or for topic tonight, why would you want to perpetuate the guilt of your people? the response of your people, mother. You know, Sister Ashley, I I think about um, there was so much that was done um, back then in in slavery to really divide and to destroy the order of the way that the Most High designed things to be uh, in the home. And uh, just one thing, if, if you think about the Willie Lynch letter, you know, that was to strip Um, the trust that a woman was to have for her man and to give that trust to someone else, you know, as her authority. And the same thing is still happening today. So we are at the point where we are truly um, needing to restore the respect, the honor, and the trust for our men, you know, especially as melanated women. We have to really put ourselves back into the position of submission and to restore what has been lost. Sister Ashley? Right. As Pastor says, you cry out for fathers. You want a father. The word tells the father to be concerned for their daughter's chastity, and you don't want them to be concerned. You don't want the law. You don't want the government. Right? Not everyone. Just just for topic discussion, let's go to... It's going to be out of Sirach 26. I'm going to play the the clip first and see if I uh, had Pastor Corey actually reading it. So I won't double up and read it first. 
All right, so my last sound clip for tonight. I hope you have something in your notes that's going to take you uh, a little further into freedom with the Messiah. Here we go. See, what the book's saying. See, don't get mad at me. The book's saying. See, look, let me read it again. Listen what it says. As a thirsty traveler opens his mouth and drinks from any, it don't matter, any water near him. So she was set in front of every tent peg. See, you ain't like I said, but the book just said, you're sitting in front of every tent peg and open her quiver to the arrow. That's how some people think. So you get hot and thirsty and you get all horny and your mind stop working and, and you just, I mean, you hot to death and guess what? You just go, you just go without... Seeking wise counsel without instruction. And all you got to do is ask yourself, is all of my ducks in a row when I get ready to do this? Because nobody should ever get married without having their ducks in a row. You don't want to say, you know what, he's cute and he talks good, but he lives in a cardboard box. That's stupid. That's stupid. That don't make sense. So, you know, we had it. So, the reason why we are doing this video, say, is just a brief. I, I had Brother Steve put it up on Facebook, Brief Harry. And I've told brothers about her that have inquired in times past that I don't know. You know, I'm talking to her to just... All right, let me interject for a moment. This is a circumstance, a situation that happened long ago. It's not even worth rehashing or bringing back up. It's just a pattern, okay? So you heard the name. It is what it is. It happened. And now he's about to describe how someone or a man or a brother might ask for someone as they did her, for example, wanting to cover her, and you're going to see how he responds. Okay, and he's been taught how to respond by our shepherd, and he's watching and discerning. Okay, so what would it, what would our leaders or elders' response be for you to be covered? All right, that's something to think about. Plant seeds before I even turn names over, and I would always say things to admonish, just to see what type of reaction I would get. To see if this is going to be good to put my name on it, to send it out. And so then you turn around, and I've seen things where you don't appear to be all in. You don't appear to move to sound with it. You got to make people wait. See, Pastor Dow always say that a new broom sweep good at first. And so in that same vein of wisdom, you know, I always tell people, look, we're we going to do this. We're going to talk about this, and then I sit and wait. Then I do the same. I sit and wait and wait and wait and watch, because I'm watching people right now. So i got to say to you that I'm watching right now that I've watched you move outside of wisdom. You moved outside of wisdom. And so there is no way possible that you're going to understand how this thing works. Because you have this thing all the way backwards because your damn mind is caught up on the wrong thing. You're not tuned in to Yahshua HaMashiach. Because guess what? He said he's going to give he gave gifts unto me. So you, you don't understand what that is. So I can't make you understand that when your ears ain't open. So I'm doing this video about... Bree Perry and the Jerry Young. Oh, yes. It gets through. We're going to get to that in a minute. But listen to Romans 16, 17. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are such serve not our master, Yahshua HaMashiach, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speech,
speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. See, that's what's going on. Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And so I ain't the one that's going to be caught up in this, and I'm not going to let you all who are true saints go on without us going through this, this proper marking this morning. You got to mark so people understand. Because some people get caught up in emotion. Why do why they leave me? You, you want to know every reason why people leave, but when we try to guard you, you think we hiding something from you. When we ain't hiding the damn thing from you, we just don't want you to have the ill will fall on your ears because you don't know how to handle it. Mother Jennifer. You know, Sister Ashley, I think about um, a, a conversation that Sister Shandre and I had, and and I remember her saying that um, before she um, was a covered woman, before she got married, she said, I, I never wanted to know who would be interested in me, who was interested in me at all. I didn't want to know. I wanted them to go directly to Pastor Dow and to Elder Rufus. And I wanted them to take it from there. She never had a, a, a curious mind to know things that didn't even matter to her. And so that is a woman that truly is a woman under submission, under subjection. And I, I think about, you know, pastor saying that, you know, revolt against authority is a pillar of feminism and witchcraft. And there's so many who refuse to have that mindset that Shandre had who are not under submission, who are not under authority. And it really brought it home when Pastor talked about that, that revolt against authority is the pillar of feminism and witchcraft. And that is the very thing, the very pillar that needs to be torn down so that we can get back into um, our right order where we belong as women. Sister Ashley. Hallelujah. Right order, where we belong as women. You produce value, my sisters. You produce it. If you want to be valuable, you produce. You don't sit and just wear a price tag. That's not how Israel works. And so, um, you know, the Messiah had a speech while he was on earth when he talked to the disciples in Matthew 10. And, you know, he was warning them of, you know, not peace, but a sword, have no fear, um, he that receives you receives me, and he's going on having this dialogue, um, and, he, and he had a correlation between the sparrows and his men that he was talking to, so you have to check out the full story in context, but in Matthew ten thirty, it says, the very hairs of your head are numbered, you know, that's a very um, accepting and loving Statement: The very ha hairs of your head are numbered. You have to find value of self in this word by living it. It's not going to just uh, arrive to you. I, I tell women all the time, you are sovereign over your emotions. You are. Yah doesn't just swoop down and take one from you. Yes, he delivers you, but it's such an um, expectation and requirement from you you know, so you want to do a checklist for value. And then, you know, as soon as we speak on something like this, well, Ashley said do a checklist for value. So you sit down, you do the checklist, and it's empty and you're condemned, you know, or you're beating yourself up or you're, you're hearing from rejected. No, see the way Yah sees you and see your value. Produce, you know, um, multiply it. Don't, don't bury his talent. Increase his talent. And Jesus was an example of severe hate, spite, accusation, hurt, everything imaginable. He was made weak, just like you as a rape victim, you as a molest, uh, molested child, you as a, um, not to bring his sacrifice down, I don't mean that, but my sisters, you've been brought to a low estate. You know, you've been greatly humbled. Um, whether you lay yourself out there and you're guilty or you cried in the field or you didn't, um, all these circumstances, you know, make uh, they damage you and they they leave scars on you. But um, our Messiah, let's go to Second Corinthians thirteen. Let me see if this is in context. Okay, Second Corinthians chapter thirteen. I'm clicking on the Bible real quick. Though he was crucified through weakness, right? Pause there and think about his crucifixion and everything that he went through. Okay, in his body. He was crucified through weakness, yet he lives by the power of Yah. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of Yah. So there's 
so much more that can be produced from you that can glorify him so that you would have a testimony and a story to say, look what he's done. That's what it's about. It's about glorifying him, not just setting you free, right? Um, but I want to end with these verses, Mother Jennifer, and then you can end the show. Sirach, chapter 26, verse 22, a prostitute is regarded as spittle, and a married woman as a tower of death to her lover. A godless wife is given as a portion to a lawless man, but a pious wife is given to the man who fears Yah. A shameless woman constantly acts disgracefully, but a modest daughter will even be embarrassed before her husband. A headstrong wife is regarded as a dog, but one who has a sense of shame will fear Yahweh. A wife honoring her husband will seem wise to all, but if she dishonors him in her pride, she will be known to all as ungodly. Happy is the husband of a good wife, for the number of his years will be doubled. A loud-voiced and garrulous wife is like a trumpet sounding the charge, and every person like this lives in the anarchy of war. Mother Jennifer, in the show. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you, that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Master, Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Shalom. Shalom.